My guest today is Christine Wohar. She's going to talk to us today about Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. If you don't know about Frassati, you need to know about him. She's the author of a new book called Finding Frassati. She's considered a world expert on the life and devotion of Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. And she's always looking for a good cup of cappuccino. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to have you today. Yeah, it's a great way to kick off my um, celebration of the biggest time of the year in the Frasati world. This whole time surrounding his feast day, I like to say it's like our Christmas. We're not uh, retail, but in a certain sense, it's the feast day of the saint. That's the whole season around it. It's kind of like our most special time of the year. So I appreciate you talking to me today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm looking forward to it. Tell us how you became interested in Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. Well, um, this is a case of how God writes straight with crooked lines or laughs at our plans, one of the two. Uh, I came to Nashville to go to law school here at Vanderbilt. And within, I want to say, almost 12 hours of, of setting my first foot on solid ground here, I was introduced to, uh, at the time, the young associate pa uh, pastor, and that was just my trip to come down and try to find a place to stay mm -hmm. to get set for law school. Um, I started going to a church that had mass at 630 in the morning and, uh, and a great, strong prayer group, and we would go to mass and pray and then go to the bravery, and this priest was very young and he was very um, involved in all of that. And one day he asked me to help him start a group for young adults, which I thought, this is crazy. I'm brand new. I don't know anybody. Like why ask a Yankee? Um, even worse, you know, what they call the ones that stick around. So, and then I was in law school and really a little bit naive about the demands of first year of law school, to be honest. But this priest actually was a convert who had gone to law school at Vanderbilt himself and then converted. And he knew the rigors of law school. So why he ever asked me, I don't know. But we joke now, He, you know, I'm the founder of Frasati USA, but I always say that he's the first cause. And he says, no, no, God's the first cause. But I say, well, if you trace back Frasati USA, it goes to Father Baker, who started the whole ball rolling. And he one day came and said, we'll call it the Frasati Society. And I never, never heard of Pierre Giorgio Frasati, but I sure do now know a lot more about him. So, so it all started with that, that move here and that chance, I don't want to say a chance encounter, but in a certain sense, the Lord obviously had bigger plans for my coming to Nashville than I realized even at the time. Tell us a little about a little bit about the childhood uh, for Saudi. Well, one of the biggest problems I think we have in, in this country is, and why this book is actually, I hope, going to be helpful. We only have a few books in English and they're biographies and they're translations or adaptations from Italian books. And so mm -hmm. what we get of a picture of Pier Giorgio's early life and in his family life is kind of quite harsh. And some of this comes from his sister himself, but if you if you know the backstory, you'd understand more why it's come across this way. But he was born into a very influential family. Um, his father, by the time Pier Giorgio was 12 years old, his father um, had been a very successful businessman. He started, he was a journalist, he's a journalism major, and he had a, um, I mean, he had a, a degree in law as well. Um, I should take that back because our 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 understanding of law degrees are different than the Italian. But the bottom line is his his father was very important and influential. Mm -hmm. So he borrowed a lot of money from his mother and renamed this newspaper in that Turin area and called it La Stampa. La Stampa became the um, number one morning paper in Italy and is still a very wild, widely circulated, important paper. And because of his journalistic influence, I mean, that was like. I don't know who you would compare that to that people would relate to in these days, but a, you know, a big newspaper publisher. He became a senator for um, Italy, which was a kingdom at the time and was the youngest senator of, of the land of 
of Italy, and then he became an ambassador. So Pier Giorgio was born into a world with, you know, a butler, chauffeur, maids, gardeners, cooks, uh, a father who was very well known and and spent time with very influential people. His mother was an artist, we say all the time. Um, she was an excellent artist, not just like a casual painter, but um, she studied art under a, a well-known um, artist in that area and had her paintings exhibited, even one of them bought by the King of Italy at a big exhibition. So, so Pier Giorgio was exposed to the arts as well in that way. And, and the family had big connections of composers and artists and things like that. So he was born into a world and grew up in a world of influence, um, political circles, art circles, uh, affluence, and, um, and yet no spirituality really per se that we would think, oh, well, he became a saint because his family was praying the rosary every night or something like that. Nothing like that. His father didn't go to church widely misunderstood about his father, but he was a cradle Catholic, but at that point he didn't go to church, you know, fallen away from the faith. His mother went to church on Sundays primarily, and so um, it was definitely not, uh, let's, you know, we pray at the meals and say the prayers together and go to church as a family, anything like that. So in a way, he had a lot of reasons to not be interested at all or practice his faith. Um, he had the pressures of the society, the, the privileges of society, and the lack of spirituality, really, that we would think you would have for someone like him in the home. Why is he considered the man of the Beatitudes? Well, he, he got this title in a funny sort of way, or um, not funny, but a fascinating sort of way, casually in um, the 70s when Cardinal Voitia, the Cardinal of Archbishop of Krakow, was asked to go over to the Dominican church in, in Krakow where they were having this youth gathering and they had a big exhibit of photos of Pier Giorgio. Uh, Pier Giorgio's um, sister, Luciana, married a Polish diplomat, a, a man of, true lineage of true nobility lineage and so she was um they spent mo a lot of their time they in poland so there was there's a very strong connection to poland for Pierre Giorgio's sister not for him so keep in mind that because he was he spent time in poland traveling around but his sister the one who we largely credit for all of the promotion of him was had a strong connection to Poland. And so she prepared this exhibit in Krakow. And when Cardinal Wojtyla walked over and looked at those pictures, he was just so enthralled. And he went to the a conference that he was opening and he said very excitedly, go and look at these photos and behold the man of the eight Beatitudes who brings to us the good news of the gospel. He was you know, very excited. Mm -hmm. And then you fast forward a few years uh, later when the family was doing an exhibit like that in Rome, and they were asked to kind of give a title of it. And they were thinking, uh, well, there's this obscure unknown cardinal in Krakow who called him the man of the eight Beatitudes. But that obscure unknown cr cardinal in Krakow, just almost soon after that, became one of the greatest popes of all time. And he used that term again at the beatification ceremony in 1990 on the piazza at St. Peter's. He, he referred to him again as the man of the Beatitudes. So it's, it was actually a name, a title that was given to him from just an exuberance of Pope John Paul II as Cardinal Wojtyla to see him because he had known of Pier Giorgio and was inspired by him when he himself was a young man. But I think it goes deeper why he's known that is because he lived that spirituality what we would call, I think, some of us, the beatitude spirituality, the, the things that we that we do to make us blessed and happy, as opposed to the command, Ten Commandments spirituality, I often say the, 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 the rules and the things that we feel constrict us or confine us that we have to just, the don'ts versus the do's. So I think Pierre Giorgio was a man of action, um, somebody that did the do's and, um, you know, inspires us to do them as well. I think that's one of the things that Pope John Paul II loved about him. Also, they shared that great love for the outdoors. Yes, right. Um, Pope John Paul II said, 
I, he said a lot of things about Pier Giorgio. In fact, all of the popes, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, they've all encouraged um, throughout their pontificate at different times for uh, people to get to know Pier Giorgio. But I think that affinity, um, that real closeness was uh, with John Paul, that added to it a lot, um, the love for the mountains and the outdoors. And if you go to Polone, which I do really suggest because it's the place where you get to know Pier Giorgio the best. His body is in Turin, in the cathedral where the Shroud of Turin is, but um, the real essence of him is there in Polone. And there's a, a monument outside of the cemetery. It's a little village, you know, and it, there's a monument and it has Pier Giorgio side by side with Pope John Paul. And it's it's got like a sundial on the bottom, but they're looking up the monument, you know, they're etched into that monument, kind of looking up toward the top of Mount Mucrone. And, you know, that was uh, actually Pope John Paul II was uh, on one of his mountain vacation times and unofficially came to Polone in 1989, which was one of the uh, was a big moment when the family knew Pier Giorgio would be beatified because he made an unofficial stop from one of his mountain uh, retreats, the Pope. So that definitely was an appeal for him. Skiing, mountain climbing. I mean, we have great pictures of Pope John Paul doing those things. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, definitely a connection. I well, lied. I, said I would shorten my answers, but I lied so far. I'm going to do better. Hang in there, people. <laughs> <laughs> what other sports did uh, Blessed Giorgio, Pierre Giorgio, like? I think if it was something that could be done, he did it. He was very well known for his biking trips. Um, there are some great letters in the book. One of them I, uh, in the book of his letters, there's a book all just his letters to his friends and family. Um, in the book that um, that we're uh, just now publishing Finding for Saudi. I like to have each chapter begins with a quote of his, but I do refer and draw from his letters throughout each of the reflections. And in one of the letters to his mother, he writes, um, because they sent telegrams and postcards all the time, there were no smartphones uh, and the telephones weren't the way to communicate. And he wrote to his mother, I've just arrived in Albasola, which was a beach town and dirty as a pig because he had biked. And the distance between, the family had a, a large home in Turin, but a summer home up in the mountains up there at the base of the mountains in Polone. And they were a good uh, 60 miles apart, 50 to 60 miles apart or kilometers, uh, more than 60 miles. And he would bike that distance. So, um, he was a tremendous athlete. He rode horses. His father had a, an Italian stallion named Parsifal that was very difficult to ride. Pier Giorgio rode that horse and he would go through town and people would say, many people, that the horse was trained almost, looked seemingly trained by Pier Giorgio. When Pier Giorgio would pass a church, he would stop to make the large sign of the cross to reverence the blessed sacrament. And the horse looked like it was genuflecting. Um, and that was a horse that only he and his father really were able to ride. He loved the sea, so he went sailing, kayaking, canoeing, anything that you can do on the water, swimming, you know, really just about anything, a tremendous uh, physical athlete. Why do you think he's so appealing to young people, Christine? The number one word I hear about Pier Giorgio is he's so relatable. And I think there's a lot of reasons for this. First of all, he's a very attractive guy. Um, and so I hear a lot of times from women about, you know, he's easy on the eyes and that's it's very true. Men, I think, really respond to him because he was such a man's man. Um, mm -hmm. He was a very strong person. All right. Physically, yes, but also in his character and his courage. So uh, I like the fact that your um, podcast is a regular Catholic guy because that's how he's described so often, just a regular Catholic guy. And that's why he's so loved. Pope John Paul II said that at a superficial glance, he seems just ordinary, like nothing out of the ordinary about this guy. But that ordinariness is why he's so appealing because you see in him, um, he had parents from a bad marriage. He struggled with his grades. He fell in love with the girl, but he wasn't able to really pursue that relationship. He had a lot of friends. He was life life of the party. He was athletic. He came from a you know a nice home, but he was detached from his from the wealth. He cared for the poor. Like he just he just loved God, and that was the focus of his life. 
and he did it in a way that's easy. Um, not that we shouldn't make sacrifices and fast. He did all of those things. But the old saints who did the severe mortifications, they really turn off <laughs> some of my friends. They're like, why did we have that period in the church? Um, Pierre Giorgio shows us that in your ordinary life, in your ordinary life, just living your ordinary life and doing it in a way that centers around God, you can be holy. And that's the appeal, that in your ordinary life, if you make God the focus, he said, if it's the center of all your actions, God is the center of all your actions, then yes, you will reach the goal, heaven, holiness. Mm -hmm. He died at a very young age. What happened? Pierre Giorgio died in like one week's time, really. Um, there's a beautiful book by his sister, Luciana, called My Brother Pierre Giorgio, His Last Days. Uh, these books are also mentioned in the in the book I have, Finding Frasati, because I really strongly recommend reading them. Because the the book I have, Finding Frasati, is not a biography, per se. And if you want to delve into those things, particularly the last week of his life, that is the book to read. He was a strong, virile, um, active young man, and in a week he died from polio. So. Much like today's situation, it was a virus that was highly contagious and deadly to uh, um, different people. They don't know how he got it, but he spent his life going and helping the poor and he would go into the worst areas of Turin where the sickest of the sick were. There's a hospital there that has a wing dedicated to him. And it was where you would go and there would be lepers. Um, and he would go, Pierre Giorgio wasn't, his charity wasn't just write a check or drop a box off at the Goodwill, you know, or it would be St. Vincent de Paul for him. Mm -hmm. uh, he went and played with the children. He, he pulled carts through the streets of the belongings of people. He was very hands-on. So they don't know how he got polio, but we can guess that it came from one of those encounters. They considered it even a miracle that no one else in his family contracted that disease. And it led to a very um, lonely death for him because it was a highly contagious disease. And by the time they discovered it, really by the time they discovered it, he died within um, 24 to 36 hours. I mean, he was sick and slowing down for about a week, but his grandmother was dying of old age in the same home. And so he went ignored by his family. And then when he finally was diagnosed on July 3rd, he, you know, it was really late and he died the next day without being able to have a lot of priests come to see him that wanted to, or the friends come to see him because they were told then that it, because it was a contagious disease that they really shouldn't be doing those things. So that was an extra sacrifice um, for him as well, something else to offer up at the time of his death. One of the processes of when they're checking on someone to, through the sainthood process is to exhume the body. What did they find when his body was exhumed? He was perfect to, to, to repeat exactly what I was told by one of his nieces. I had asked one of his nieces, what was it that, or when did you realize there was something special about your uncle? And she said two things. One, when they opened the coffin, um, the family was there. And like you say, this is part of the process just to examine the relics of the saint who's being proposed for the beatification. And they had a team of medical experts from the Vatican because they expected to be there for a week or more counting the bones, you know, and documenting things like that. Beautiful article in Italian by uh, one of the priests who was present there. And it says, I met Pier Giorgio Fersati. I saw him because when they opened the coffin, there was a little bit of the tuft of his hair showing when, and they pulled back that shroud and he was perfect. And his sister was there and several of his nieces and nephews. And the one said to me, I'm a doubting Thomas. And for me, seeing is believing. And when she saw her uncle for the very first time, she said his hair, his teeth, the smile on his lips, he was perfect. Um, and then she said, and the second thing was when the Pope comes to your house, because uh, as I said, Pope John Paul made an unofficial visit there in 1989. And, and then Pierre Giorgio was beatified the next day. People ask me, well, isn't that the miracle for canonization that he was incorrupt? But it's just a special grace from the Lord. And then they say, why isn't he on display? 
Um, his body is not on display. In fact, you can walk past his altar there at the cathedral in Turin and not even realize that you have passed it because there's a floral pattern below the altar and his coffin is behind that floral pattern. It's a it's an artwork painted. It's a floral pattern painted by his mother. So you don't see his body. The family doesn't want to have him on display. And so he's never, his body has never been on display. And there is a picture on our website of him in death, but that picture is before he was buried. Mm -hmm. um, and, but that picture, I think, gives you a really good idea of what the family saw when the coffin was opened back in, uh, you know, 60, almost 60 years later. Christine, what is the website? Um, FrasadiUSA.org. Frasadi is two S's and one T. FrasadiUSA.org. We'll put that in the show notes as well so people can look that up and see that picture. What's the best way to learn more about Frasati? Well, um, this book, Finding Frasati, I hope will be an introductory book. It probably will be an introductory book for a lot of people who don't want to read a long biography. Um, and, and that's really the goal is to um, give you a taste of his life and what's important to him and his spirituality and his prayer life and maybe incorporate those things into yours. In addition, I think the best books to read are by his sister and the letters by himself. The website for SaudiUSA.org, what we really try to do is be the source of accurate information. Um, I'm sure there are mistakes in my own uh, book, Finding for Saudi, but um, I know that with the translations and adaptations from my conversations with his uh, niece, some things just get translated wrong and then they're in the book forever and then it perpetuates itself. And so there are books that are out there that have a lot of misinformation, but there are only a few in English. So we should go for the accurate ones. And I think the things by his sister are the best. And the Frasati USA website, it should be accurate. It should be a place where you can go to find out if something really is true. And if you're not finding it there, just send me a, a question, an email with a question and we'll get the answer for you. Well, one thing is you've been able to spend some time with the family too. Yeah, this has been probably the biggest privilege of all time because Pierre Giorgio's sister, Luciana, lived to be 105. And I met her at 103 um, and, and it actually was two days, when I met Luciana, it was two days before she turned 104. So I was able to be there for her birthday party when she turned 104 and I was actually there the last, most of the last month of her life uh, before she died at 105 and I was able to be at her funeral um, and she has six children. Uh, one just passed away in January, and the other five are alive. And many, she has many uh, grandchildren, great grandchildren, who I've gotten to know as well. And really, to be able to spend time in a place where Pierre Giorgio spent time, and to talk to his family, um, to immerse in his world, um, those are opportunities that are probably not going to be possible for many people from this point on, and I treasure them. Um, and it was a real uh, grace and a gift. Bishop Egan from England wrote the foreword for the book, and he says that um, we don't choose the saints, the saints choose us. And, and really, it's a big joke that the Lord and Peter Giorgio played on me, I think, because like I said, I came to Nashville to go to law school. Uh, I thought I would be doing pro-life law, to be honest with you, Jeff, and my biggest pro-life case was when I got arrested one day at an abortion mill, so it's kind of a little bit of a joke. That was my pro-life um, law, was my being on trial. <laughs> and um, instead, there was a running theme throughout from the very first day, really, of Pier Giorgio. And so he chose me in so many ways um, to be able to do this kind of work. And it's, it's just, it's an incredible blessing. That's awesome. Why is this feast day the 4th of July? He died on the 4th of July. He died on the 4th of July. And typically that's uh, the day the church assigns as a feast day, which I love personally. It's a great coincidence um, for us here that that's our, um, you know, big day to celebrate in every way. You get the day off. Just think you get Pierre Giorgio's feast day off like almost every every year if you don't have some kind of a crazy job that requires you to work those federal holidays. But you get his day off. You get to shoot off fireworks. You get to celebrate in style all because of Pierre Giorgio. Uh, unfortunately, because of that, because it is our uh, Independence Day, it's often not celebrated. Uh, I think even if he's 
uh, canonize. It won't get put on the church calendar, probably liturgically on the 4th of July, I would suspect because of that conflict here in the US, but yeah, he died on the 4th. So Christine, when does the book come out? The book comes will, will be in stores, I'm told, August 1st. There's an uh -huh. e-book, a Kindle version that's available for download. What's and the best place to get the book? The Sophia Institute Press website. And we'll put that uh, they, show they have the pre-order information available. And um, I will tell you and your listeners that during the nine days, um, the Frasati Novena in honor of his birthday begins June 25th and it goes to July 3rd and then we celebrate the 4th of July. And if you go online to order the book, to pre-order the book during mm -hmm. that 10-day period, you can put in the code Frasati25 and get 25% off just for those 10 days uh, in the pre-order period. Frasati 25. Awesome. Anything else you'd like to share with the regular Catholic guys out there, Christine? I would just say this, um, get to know Pierre Giorgio. That Pope is the words of Pope John Paul II is get to know him because he shows us how to be holy and his holiness is possible. Um, that's the message of Pierre Giorgio Frasati. And that's what was reiterated by Pope John Paul in his beatification homily, which is on the website. Um, he testifies that holiness is possible. He testifies that it's possible for everyone and he makes it attractive um, and he makes it doable. And we need men like Pierre Giorgio in our culture now more than ever. And so if you have moments of how do I live out the Catholic faith and can I be strong enough to do it? This is a guy that will show you, yes, you can do it. You can be holy in the church and the culture needs you to do that. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. God bless. Verso alto.